Hi, and welcome to a special Death From Above episode of InstaVision. Well, yeah, really. I mean, the more we look for asteroids uh, that come close to Earth, the more of them we tend to find. Uh, and just recently, asteroid 2012 DA14 passed within 17,000 miles of the Earth. That's closer than a communications satellite. Uh, and even more recently, a meteor exploded over Russia, injuring over 1,000 people. Uh, that was pretty dramatic, too. So everybody's talking about this problem, but uh, forget talking about it. What to do? Well, Ed Liu is a former astronaut and has a Ph.D. in astrophysics from Stanford. Uh, now he's with the B612 Foundation, and he has a plan. Welcome, Ed. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. So should we be worrying about asteroids? Uh, how big is the risk? It's a long-term issue. A um, couple of statistics for you. Um, we know how many asteroids are out there because we can count craters on the moon. And we can count the small number of asteroids that we can spot that come close to the Earth. And so there's no real debate about the statistics. It's like a giant game of roulette, if you'd like. Uh, there's a 30% chance in this century that there's going to be a 5 megaton or larger impact somewhere on the surface of the Earth. That's the same size of the, of the asteroid that hit in Tunguska in 1908 on June 30th, 1908. Um, that's about, for scale, about 500 times the size of the asteroid that hit, or, or of the nuclear weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima. So... 30% chance this century. Uh, it's true that most of the planet is not populated, but it sure would be a shame if it landed on a city now, wouldn't it? Uh, on the larger size, there is a roughly 1% chance that there is going to be an asteroid of 100 megatons or larger impact energy that's going to hit the Earth this century. Uh, for scale, all the weapons used in World War II, including the atomic weapons, if you threw them all into one giant pit and set them off at the same time, that's about one-fifth that size. So you're talking sort of World War III-ish. And again, most of the Earth is unpopulated. But it really would be a shame if that happened in an ocean and set off a tsunami, or if it landed on you know, a major city or a, some small country and obliterated it. At the point is, we could actually change that. We don't have to sit there and take it. And our feeling is that we have the technology to do something about this, so we should. So at this, at this very moment, uh, what, what can we do about asteroids? Um, right now, at this very moment, we can't do much about things because we haven't tracked them. You can't deflect an asteroid that you haven't yet tracked. If you don't know exactly where it is, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Um, our expected warning time right now for an asteroid like the one that you saw, you're seeing in the video there, uh, is zero. Because we're, not, we're only tracking a little less than 1% of those that are larger than the one that destroyed 1,000 square miles in 1908. Um, but here's the interesting thing. We actually have the technology to deflect them today. We just can't use that technology because we don't know where most of the asteroids are. So what's the B612 Foundation, and what's your plan? We are a private organization. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in Mountain View, California. And we are building a space telescope that's going to find and track all these asteroids. What actually happened is about 10 years ago, our group of us, scientists, engineers, astronauts, began looking at the problem of deflecting asteroids. And we realized exactly what I told you, that we knew how to deflect asteroids because you only need to change their velocity by a really tiny amount if you want to deflect one. We realized then that our technology is useless because we haven't done a complete catalog, a complete search for asteroids. And we, I was lamenting that fact in a talk I was giving at Google one day. Uh, where I used to work. And uh, I had sort of an epiphany moment there because some guy came up to me afterwards and goes, well, he goes, you can try all you want, you know, going to Washington, D.C. and try and figure out the problem of how you're going to get federal funding for this and do all those, you know, figuring out how you're going to make this happen. Or you can just do it yourself. He came up to me and said, well, why don't you just do it yourself? And I said, well, how are we going to do that? We need a few hundred million dollars to build a space telescope. I go, we can do it a factor of at least too cheaper than the federal government because we're a private organization and we can be small and nimble, but still a lot of change. And he goes, hey, we're building a, uh, the, a new wing for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. It's a wonderful museum. I've been to it myself. And he goes, yeah, we're, we're, we're raising $400 million to build the new wing. He goes, and we'll be successful. Nobody has any doubt about that. In fact, now they're raising $550 million to build that new wing, uh, new wing of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So he said to me, and this was the quote that actually got us running down this line, he said, 
if we can raise a few hundred million dollars to build the wing of an art museum, can you raise a few hundred million dollars to save the world? And that's what got us started. It was a little over a year ago. Um, donations have been coming in. We've been talking to large donors, just as museums or performing arts centers do when they build a, a new wing or a new addition or something like that. Uh, we're going about it the same way. We are finding people that want to change the future of the earth and realizing that they have it in their power to do that and that they don't have to ask permission. You can just go do it. Isn't that great? Well, speaking of just going and do it, uh, not only is there a nonprofit operation like this, but in the for-profit sector, I noticed we're seeing a lot of companies, uh, one of the best known, although it's not the only one, is Planetary Resources, uh, who are actually aiming at locating and harvesting near-Earth asteroids for minerals and water and oxygen. Uh, and that's something I've favored for a long time, but it's occurred to me uh, that maybe it has some relevance to this problem, too. Well, we've got a little bit of video to run here. We've been searching for near-Earth objects mainly to assess the hazard of an impact on the Earth. Turns out that most of these asteroids are not a threat to the Earth, but they do offer potential benefits. They're in Earth-like orbits that offer accessible resources that we can tap into, both for scientific knowledge and returning those strategic supplies to Earth. So you've sort of got two things going on here. On the one hand, uh, we're worried about the downside, and we're looking to try to find asteroids uh, that might be a threat, so that if we can find them and they are a threat, we can move them out of the way. On the other hand, uh, on the opposite side of fear, uh, we've got hope where we're looking for asteroids that are come close to the Earth so that we can move them to where they'll be useful and use them for um, expanding our presence in space. It seems to me there's some synergy there. Do you think that these kind of private enterprise things will build capabilities that will also be useful for addressing dangerous asteroids? Oh, absolutely. You got this right. Uh, you know, I, I always used to say that someday off in the distant future, you know, my hope is that when you find a threatening asteroid, you know, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, or something like that, you go, hey, inst we'll just call up the Ace Asteroid Mining Company and, and put out a contract to have them either mine it or move it. Um, that being said, if you're concerned about asteroids that are going to hit us this century, uh, we actually have that technology right now. It wouldn't be for mining, to just give them a tiny nudge. Now, all you really need to do is simply run into it with a small spacecraft. That's enough momentum uh, to, uh, it's like playing billiards. You're going to change its orbit by uh, one part in a million or one part in, a, in 10 million. Um, that's enough to keep it from hitting the Earth. Um, the, you're, you're absolutely right about the synergy, though, because the, you cannot mine an asteroid that you don't know where it is, right? And uh, Planetary Resources, and there's another company called uh, Deep Space Industries, uh, they're both wholly dependent upon us to be successful because they cannot find asteroids either. Um, we are building an infrared space telescope. It's called Sentinel. It launches in July of 2018. We're well on our way. Um, it is going to go up on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, and it is going to map the million or so asteroids larger than the one that hit in Tunguska that are that whose orbits cross the Earth and therefore either will come near Earth at some point or may hit the Earth. Now, um, our telescope is roughly a factor of 100 times more effective than all other telescopes planned or in existence combined. So it, wow. it, it, it's going to find all of these asteroids and it'll provide the definitive map of all the asteroids in our solar system. It's interesting because we can find we know more about the million nearest stars because you can point your telescopes away from the sun and look at stars out there than we know about the million nearest asteroids because that requires that your telescopes point at times inwards towards the sun. And that's why you can't spot these things very well from the ground. You actually need to have a telescope that's well inside Earth's orbit looking outwards, and that's what our plan is. That's very, very cool. It's a very interesting synergy of capabilities uh, with private commercial space companies and things, too. A lot of stuff I thought about in the 80s and 90s seems to be finally coming it's together. It's coming true. It's amazing, uh, it isn't is it? It is the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeted right after that Russian meteor. You know, he said, asteroids are nature's way of asking, hey, how's that space program coming along? Uh, it's true, of course, that the risk is hard to quantify in terms of the next few years or something. Uh, but is there an urgency to this? Well, yeah. I mean, the urgency is, at least for the planetary defense case, 
that there's an asteroid out there that's going to hit in the next 20, 30 years, and we don't know about it. And again, that risk is sort of, if it's 30% in the next 100 years, so in the next 20 or, or 30 years, then, you know, scale it down 10% or so, that there's going to be a random 5 megaton impact somewhere on the surface of the Earth. Um, I actually testified in front of Congress about this last uh, last maybe three weeks ago, and I posed a question to them. I said, what if somebody told you that there was a 30% chance that there's going to be a random five megaton nuclear explosion somewhere this century? What would you do to prevent that? You know, their answer is, of course, well, we'll move heaven and earth to prevent that, even if, right? Because it's their responsibility. This is sort of the inverse tragedy of the commons. If it's everybody's responsibility to protect the Earth, it's nobody's responsibility. And so we decided we'd just go do it. And we're just finding individuals, uh, wealthy individuals and foundations, who want to make an impact, no pun intended, and uh, uh, change, change this for the good. And at the same time, open up the solar system in the sense of providing the roadmap for companies like... Uh, planetary resources or deep space industries, or for, for NASA to go follow with scientific missions for all of that. All of that is opened up when you know where these things are. Well, for our viewers, what should they be doing if they want to know more or get involved or support these efforts? Well, our website is b612foundation.org, and uh, you can sign up there to either learn more about it. We've got um, plenty of everything from technical reports uh, for those who have... Uh, the stomach for such things, to more uh, popular accounts about what are asteroids, why we know there, are, how we know how many there are, and so on. And uh, you can donate there too. Um, we have an active online donor base, and uh, we thank those folks for uh, making something happen. The beauty is it. Well, thanks uh, so much. Again, it, go, it goes back to we didn't have to ask anyone's permission. We're just going and doing it. Well, I like that approach. I really do. And thanks so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with us. And thank you for uh, letting us tell our story. And that's Ed Liu of the B612 Foundation, protecting us from incoming asteroids and other forms of death from above. Uh, that's all for this episode of InstaVision. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, have fun on the Internet. Thanks.